you showed that up until the very early 60s, there was a strong correlation on a, on a, bar, on a, uh, on a uh, if you look at me, uh, chart showing, showing the rate of black male un or non-white unemployment, it was called in, the census didn't uh, take blacks out, non-white unemployment, most, most of these were black, and, and, the, and the welfare take up with the aid to, family, aid to families with dependent children, the AFDC program. And this, this was parallel. Then, starting in the early 60s, the unemployment rate, these were good years, starts to go down a little bit. The other goes like this. There's a scissors here. So he says something's happening here. It, it's, uh, the, uh, the illegitimacy rate is going up, or ratio, I wish you'd call it. It's not the rate. The percentage of births that are out of wedlock is going up, and uh, unemployment is not going up quite so fast. Something else is happening. It's not just economics. Something deeper is happening to the black family. And he had a longest chapter near the end called The Tangle of Pathology, uh, which uh, left the impression, of course, that this was a desperate situation and that blacks in lower these lower class families were living in a pathological situation. Um, this was a liberal document, however. He started by saying that the reasons blacks have so much problem, problem is because there is a racist virus, a racist virus in the American bloodstream. Describing black, the history of blacks in the United States, he said that they had suffered from, quote, three centuries of unimaginable mistreatment. There was not the slightest suggestion in here uh, uh, that, Moore, that Moynihan was uh, regarding um, blacks having children out of wedlock as acting immorally. It was not a moralistic document. In fact, uh, it was not uh, even an uplifting document. Uh, he he didn't you know praise uh, for instance the capacity of blacks to deal with all of this as some people did with kin relationships. Uh, he thought to do that would make it seem as if he thought this was the answer, which he didn't. So um, it's it's a liberal document, uh, and it's it, it and and it's subtitled a case for national action, which was also the title of a very brief final chapter indicates that what he wanted to do was people to study his statistics and his descriptions, uh, get together quietly within the White House and higher circles of the Labor Department and other uh, bureaucracies in the, in the, uh, for instance, the Office of Economic Opportunity and, um, and see what they could do about it. Um, what he said, in fact, was not particularly uh, striking to anybody who really knew uh, what the situation was. Kenneth Clark's book, Dark Ghetto, for instance, said very much the same things as Moynihan did. In fact, the phrase tangle of pathology was Clark's. Clark was a black psychologist. Moynihan was a Catholic white guy, a messenger carrying bad news. And you know about messengers, right? They get in trouble sometimes just because they're messengers. All right, folks, um, for all my subbies that are out there that have hung with me on this particular series, I applaud you. Uh, this is this is very game heavy. This is very technical. This is uh, non-emotional. When I go to the board and I start marking up documents, I understand it's like being in school. And um, that old adage about if you want to hide something for black from black folks, what do you do? You put it in a book. And this is a book, so I didn't expect to get a lot of um, of my subbies coming along with me and actually viewing this. You know, I think I got almost, uh, I think I got about a thousand um, subs, and uh, it, it's less than a quarter. It's about a quarter of the my subbies that are actually um, viewing this particular title. It might be even less. So uh, I applaud the people that actually stuck with it. Um, hopefully, that you can get something out of it. and You're gonna learn something. But this is the uh, the biggest and most controversial uh, chapter of the uh, document. Um, it's probably the most game heavy. Uh, I call it game heavy uh, portion of the document. So um, I hopefully I can do this in two uh, videos. It might take three, but we're going to give it a shot. So get ready. Hold on to your horses. This is getting ready to get deep. Uh, like, uh, 
like uh, uh, Cypher said in the Matrix, uh, hold on, Dorothy, because uh, Kansas is getting ready to go bye bye. Chapter five, four, the tangle of pathology. The Negro American has survived at uh, survived at all is extraordinary. Oh, that the Negro American has survived at all is extraordinary. A lesser people might simply have died out, much like the American Indian, as indeed others have. That's very true. Uh, there was a document talking about. Uh, German immigrants that came to work in Jamaica and I thought like 90% of them died because of the heat and the uh, and the and the work they had to do the Negro community has not only survived but in this political generation has entered and net entered national affairs as a moderate humane and constructive national force it is the highest testament to the healing powers of the democratic ideal and the creative vita vitality of the Negro people. He's giving us kudos now, but we're getting, you know, other stuff is coming later. But it may not be supposed that the Negro American community has not paid a fearful price for the incredible mistreatment to which it has been subjected over the past three centuries. In essence, the Negro community has been forced into a matriarchal structure. There's the first one. It's a forced matriarchal structure, which because it is so out of line, here we go, so out of line with the rest of the American society, seriously retards the progress of the group as a whole and imposes a crushing burden on the Negro male, which feminists hate, on a great many, and a great many Negro women as well. So a lot of these women think that uh, what happens to the men doesn't affect them. You can see, but you can see why this document was uh, so severely suppressed, especially in the black community. There is presumably no special reason why a society in which males are dominant in family relationships is to be preferred to a matriarchal arrangement. He's not saying that matriarchy is wrong. He's saying that it does not work in the environment that you're in. However, it is clearly a disadvantage for a minority group to be operating on one see this is so much i'm, I'm you know I, I, this is i'm, I'm not going to mark up of the whole page however it is clearly a disadvantage for a minority group to be operating on one principle while the great majority of the population and one with the most advantages to begin with is operating on another This is the present situation of the Negro. Our society, which presumes male leadership in private and public affairs. The great arrangements of society facilitate such leadership and reward it. A sub, a, a sub, I've been saying this for years, a subculture. Such as that of the Negro American, which is not the pattern placed at a distinct in which this is not the pattern is placed at a distinct disadvantage this is come from this is coming from a manager not coming from your so-called leaders this is a manager that has to make decisions about running a country here an earlier word of caution should be rep repeated there is much evidence that a considerable number of negro families have managed to break out of the tangle of pathology See, there's some some people that have gotten away from it. And to establish themselves as stable, effective units living in according to patterns of American society. E. Franklin Frazier 
has suggested that the middle class Negro family is, if anything, more patriarchal and protective of its children than the, fa than the general run of such families. Given equal opportunities, the children of these families will, will perform, see, given equal opportunities, the children of these families will perform as well or better than their white peers. We, we can tell that by the Africans coming in. They need no help from anyone and ask none. While this phenomenon is not easily measured, one index is that the middle class Negroes have even fewer children than middle class whites. Uh, that's something that um, Frances Chris Wilson suggested following this pattern. She probably read this document indicating a desire to conserve the advances that they have made and to ensure that their children would do as well or better. Negro women who marry early to uneducated laborers have more children than white women in the same situation. We've seen that. We've seen that to be true. Negro women who marry at the at the common age for middle class to educated men doing technical or professional work have only four fifths as many children as their white counterparts. It may be estimated that as, as much as half of the Negro community falls into the middle class. However, the remaining half is in a desperate and deteriorating circumstance. Moreover, because of housing segregation, it is immensely difficult for the stable half to escape from the cultural influence of the unstable one. Because it's because of the racist virus, you know, it's something that Sarge Willie Pete is, is, is bumping up against. And it's something that I noticed as a child. It doesn't matter. You can be you can be a millionaire and you can move your kids out of the hood. Your kids, because of the other half of the population. Because because of racism, um, black people do not exist in a class structure. And we're all grouped together and we're treated the, the same way by because of racism. So just because your child, your child could be, uh, uh, you know, you could be married to a billionaire or have come from a billionaire and you still have the same effects as any other black person because who's you know, just like Sergeant Willie Peake. He, he grew up in an upper middle class family. His mother, his father, they uh, earned in the mid six figures. They were very well educated. But what happens when they get out, they, they get older and they come out as, a, a, you know, as they come out as a, an upper middle class person, a black person, who do they have to associate with? Because of racism, they get they get stuck with the other half of the of the population that's not doing as well. And you know, for lack of a better term, they get pulled down into the same morass. Who do they have to mate with? Church and Willie Pete. That's what he complains about. I have nobody to build with. I have nobody to marry. I have problems finding a mate. So they get pulled right back into the same morass. That's why he that's why uh, that this is what he's talking about. The children of middle class Negroes often often must uh, often as not must grow up in or next to slums and experience almost unknown to white middle class children. They therefore Const are constantly exposed to the pathology of the disturbed group. Boom. Boom. This is this is this is almost this is 50 years ago, folks. This is more than 50 years ago, folks. He, he could be writing this today and it would be true. They are therefore constantly exposed to the pathology of the disturbed group and constantly in, da in danger of being drawn into it. It is for this reason 
that the propositions put forth in this study may be thought of as having more or less a general application. In other words, even though you have uh, middle class and upper middle class black folks that are doing well because of the tangle of pathology and racism, the racist virus that's in the United States, you're go in, in other words, what applies to the poor folks is going to apply to you because you're going to suffer from the same, you're going to carry the same pathology that the lower class group carries because of your culture. In a word, okay, I'm going to mark, I'm going to stop marking up as much. In a word, most Negro youth are in danger of being caught up in the tangle of pathology that affects their world. And probably, and a and probably a majority are so entrapped. Many of those who escape do for do so for only one generation. Only that's how come you got upper class black kids dealing drugs. Because they get caught up in the tangle of pathology. As things are now, now are the children may have to run the gauntlet all over over again in other words if you don't correct the problem of the lower half co correct the culture you might escape but your kids got to go through the same damn process all over again we keep seeing the same thing repeated over and over and over again you see upper class women having children out of wedlock you see them going to ratchet clubs that's how come you look at the housewives of uh, of Atlanta or the basketball wives, women that were very beautiful, raised in upper class or uh, upper middle class families, going through the same shit and, and, and exhibiting the same behavior. This is not the least vicious aspect of the world that white America has made for. So, boom. This is not the least vicious aspect of the world that white America has made for the Negro. In other words, it has to do with the structure of the country. It has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. This, all this stuff was created for you and never got fixed. Okay. <sighs> Let me take a breath. Let's go on. Obviously, not every instance of social pathology afflicting Afflicting the Negro community can be traced to the weakness of the family structure. If, for example, organized crime in the Negro community were not largely controlled by whites, there will be more capital accumulation among Negroes. And therefore, probably more Negro businesses, business enterprise, if it were not for the hostility and fear many whites exhibit toward Negroes. They they in turn would be less afflicted by hostility and fear and so on. There is no one Negro community. There is no one Negro problem. It, it is a kind of Negro, black folks. Black folks aren't a monolithic. There is no one solution. Nonetheless, at the center of the tangle of pathology is the weakness of the is the we see here we go is the weakness of the family structure what do we keep saying structure 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 once or twice removed it will be found to be a principal source of the of most of the aberrant inadequate or anti anti-social behavior that did that did not establish but now serves to perpetuate a cycle of poverty and deprivation. It's structural. It was by destroying it was by destroying the Negro family under slavery that white America broke the will of the Negro people. This is something we got to deal with. Although that will has reasserted itself in our time. It is a resurgence doomed to frustration unless the viability of the Negro family is restored. Very, this is a prophetic document. He could have wrote, he could have wrote this in the year 2000 and it will still be true. 
although that will has re reasserted itself in our time, it is a resurgence doomed to frustration unless the viability of the Negro family is restored. In other words, he was telling his managers that just because they're doing good now, the thing is you have not fixed the problem. If you don't fix the, f the freaking problem, guess what's going to happen? Everything you're gonna, you do is going to go to shit. We saw that in the 80s. We saw that in the 90s. What they had to do? Our children had to run the gauntlet all over again. What we had come out of reasserted itself in the, in the 80s and the 90s. In other words, what we did for in the civil rights movement and the things that we established all broke down and went to shit in the 80s and 90s because we didn't solve the fucking problem. Let's go on. Matriarchy. A fundamental fact of Negro American family is the often the reverse roles of husband and wife can we say gender wars this is why women this is why especially black feminists did not want this released robert o blood jr and donald m wolf in a study of detroit families note that negro husbands have unusually low power And a white, and while this is characteristic of all low-income families, the pattern pervades the the Negro social structure. In other words, it doesn't matter what class they are. It this this idea, this this uh, this structure, this pattern uh, goes through all classes of Black America. You can look at Michelle Obama and how she talks about. Barack Obama she's not passive in their relationship like most first ladies are in that same position so it doesn't matter where you are you can be in the White House or the outhouse that black woman this pattern of, uh, between black men and, and black women are the same the segre segregated housing and the poor schooling of the Negro men In 44% of the Negro families studied, the wife was dominant. Against 20% of white wives. Whereas the majority of white families are equal, equalitarian, the largest percentage of Negro families are dominated by the wife. And this, you know, the books were actually written in the 30s and 40s. You know, we're not talking about the civil rights era. We're talking about the 30s and 40s where, the, where, where these books are written. The matriarchal pattern of so many Negro families reinforces itself over the generations. This process begins with education, although the gap appears to be closing at the moment for for a long while. Negro females were better educated than Negro males. And this remains true today for the Negro population as a whole. This is 50 years ago. We just I, we just did. We just did a what? Uh, I just did a, a video to talk about Simone five, six when she's talking about how much more, more educated black females were than black males. This, you know, this stuff was written 50, 60, 70 years ago, and it was true then, and it's still true now. It has, in other words, it has not changed. That's what black women don't understand. It hasn't changed. Now, he, he gives stats about uh, median education uh, amongst non-white or black and, and female. You can see... Uh, the reason uh, white folks are successful is because they treat their children equally. You can see it's not the same thing for uh, for the black male and the black female. The difference in educational attainment between non-white men and women in the labor force is even greater. Men lag 1.1 years behind women. The disparity in educational attainment of male and female youth at, at youth age 16 to 21 who were out of school in February 1963 is striking. Among non-white males, 66.3% were 
were not high school graduates compared to 55% of females. A similar difference existed at the college level with 4.5% of males having completed one to three years of college compared to, to 7.3% of, of the females. See that it's all, you know, it's basically, it's not quite two to one, but it's, it's almost, you know, it's almost two to one. It's the ratio has increased. But the thing is, you can see this ratio setting up back then. And this is after it had improved. The poor performance of male of the male in school exists from the very beginning. And the magnitude of the difference was documented by the 1960 census and statistics on the number of children who have fallen one or more grades below the typical grade for children of the same age. The boys have more frequently fallen behind at every age level. White boys who also lag behind white girls, but differential of one to six, one to six percentage points. Basic, we'll talk about that later. Percentage of non-white youth enrolled in school who are one or more grades below mode for, uh, for age by sex. You can take a gander at the uh, at the chart. In 1960, 39 percent of all white persons 25 years of age and over had completed four more years of college. Had completed four more years of college were women. 53 percent of non-whites who had attain this level were women so in other words the disparity was already there for for black folks however the gap is closing by october 1963 there were slightly more negro men in college than women in other words when you make an effort uh uh to do things things will happen among whites there were almost twice as many men as women enrolled there is much evidence that Negro females are better students than their male counterparts. Daniel Thompson of Dillard University in private communication on January 9, 1965 writes, as, a, as low as the aspirational level amongst lower class Negro girls, it is considerably, considerably higher than, than among the boys. For example, I have examined the honor rolls in Negro high schools for about 10 years. As a, as a rule, from 75 to 90% of all Negro honor students are girls. It's structural. It's been that way. Dr. Thompson reports that 70% of all applications for the National Achievement Scholarship uh, Program financed by the Ford Foundation for Outstanding Negro High School Graduates are girls. Despite special efforts by high school principals to submit the names of boys, the finalists for this new program for Outstanding Negro Students were recently announced based on the inspection of the names. Only about 43 percent of all 639 finalists were male. However, in the regular uh, National Merit Scholarship Program, males receive 67 percent of the 1964 scholarship awards. It's at and actually basically you, you black people are in a matriarchy girls are preferred you can see the opposite effects in the white community and this is before feminism but you can see the opposite effects in the white community inevitably these disparities have carried over to the area of employment and income in one out of four negro families where the husband is present is an earner and someone else's is someone else in the family works. The husband is not the principal earner. The, uh, the comparable figure for whites is 18%. More important, it is clear that Negro females have established a strong position 
for themselves in white collar and professional employment. Precisely the areas of the economy which are growing most rapidly and to which the highest percentage is accorded. Prestige is accorded, excuse me. The President's Committee on Equal Employment Opportunity making a preliminary report on employment in 1964 or over 16,000 companies which nearly 5 million employees revealed that revealed this pattern with dramatic emphasis. In this workforce, Negro males outnumber Negro females by a ratio of 4 to 1. Yet Negro males represent only 1.2% of all males in white collar occupations, while the Negro females represent 3.1% of the total female white collar workforce. Negro males represent 1.1% of all male professionals, whereas Negro females represent roughly 6% of all female professionals. Again, in technical Occupations, Negro males represent 2.1% of all male technicians, while Negro females represent roughly 10% of all female technicians. It would appear, therefore, that the proportion, proportionately four times as many Negro females in significant white-collar jobs than Negro males. That pattern persists today. Although it is evident that office and clerical jobs account for approximately 50% of all Negro female white-collar workers it is significant that six out of every 100 negro females are in professional jobs this is substantially similar to the rate of all females in such jobs Appro approximately seven out of every 100 negro females are in technician jobs this is, exceeds the proportion of all females in technician jobs approximately five out of every 100 Negro females skilled in jobs are almost the same as all of all females in such jobs. Nine out of every 100 Negro males are skilled or in skilled occupations. While 21 out of 21 out of 100 of all males are in such jobs. The pattern is to be seen in the federal government where special efforts have been made recently to ensure equal opportunity for Negroes. These efforts have been notably successful in departments such as labor, where some 19% of employees are now Negro. Not a disproportionate percentage given the composition of the workforce in areas where the main department offices are located. However, it may, it may well be that these efforts have rebounded mostly to the benefit of Negro. However, it may well be that these efforts are rebounded mostly to the benefits of Negro women and may even have accentuated the comparative disadvantage of Negro men. Seventy percent of the Negro employees of the Department of Labor are women. As contrasted with only 42 percent of white employees amongst non-professional labor department non-professional labor department employees where the most employment opportunities exist for all all groups negro women outnumber negro women men four to one and an average almost one grade higher in classifications the testimony to the efforts of these patterns in Negro family structure is widespread, even, even amongst the middle class, and hardly to be doubted. So you see, even amongst, even amongst uh, uh, the upper class or the upper middle class, the pattern is still there. All right, uh, we're at our break. This is 30 minutes, you know, around 30 minutes at our break. So I'm going to close this one out and we're going to uh, fall in um, and continue this be this beast of a uh, document, you know, this beast of a uh, chapter. This is really game heavy. This is really game heavy. So I'm taking my time with this. Um, 
That's why the, the prescription that they use for, for the white society to bring things in balance, say bring women into balance, like for, say for feminism, just through what was already an, an imbalance in the, uh, uh, the, the, the black community that was skewed toward women, just completely, completely just blew Negro, uh, Negro men or black men out of the water. In other words, you are already not educated properly as, as black boys. We're already not educating the problem because we were using them for physical labor. And you take the physical labor jobs out, you make everything uh, uh, service jobs, which women already dominated in, you dominate in, you uh, employ feminist policies, which the black folks didn't need because women are already above their men as far as that was concerned. And guess what you did? You just exacerbated the problem that was already there. So what you did for white people didn't work for black people because our culture was fucked up and it was already upside down. And you just pushed the Negro family in the wrong way, in the wrong direction. I'm going to end with that. And that's a piece to chew on. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in the next chapter. So, uh, Hang on to your hats and be patient. I'm gonna I'm gonna get through it because this is the biggest chapter, and then the last chapter is 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 kind of moot, kind of small. So I hope that you're getting something out of it. So a lot of a lot of, I see a lot of comments that aren't understanding the document, and this is especially for Ricky. Ricky, you're gonna have to pull your head out of your ass and look at the structure, understand what went forward, because we're trying to dig in. We're trying to dig into the problem. Okay. We're not trying to talk about what exists. We're trying to understand what what is the pattern? How long has this pattern been going on and the structure of the pattern so we can do come up with remedies to fix this this goddamn thing? You know, that's why I'm into that's why I'm doing this. I'm not getting any money out of this. Um, we're trying to figure out how we can fix the goddamn thing. And this is part of the puzzle. It's just a piece of the puzzle. So with that, I'm going to close out. I'm, I'm going to sign off. This is BGS out. I'll see you on the next one.